Um, so this is a, a free webinar today that uh, we wanted to bring to you. My name is Laurie Lee. I am a business attorney and my firm is called uh, the Legal Department for, Ser for Ser Service Professionals. And all of our clients are service providers, uh, small firms, less than 20 employees. And we serve in a lot of different ways. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at our website, it is the legal department, all spelled out, the legal department dot law. And it'll tell you what we do. Um, but for today, we wanted to bring a topic to small business owners that is really important and uh, on the top of some people's minds, which is business interruption insurance. Uh, so I asked my friend, Stephen Bush here, who is an insurance attorney. And um, Stephen has a lot of experience dealing with insurance claims and um, normally deals with a lot of property insurance. And I'll let him tell you a little bit about himself. Um, so Stephen, give us a little bit of uh, information about you and your firm. Sure. Well, thank you for asking me and, and for having me here today to uh, talk about this very important topic, especially at this time. But my name is Stephen Bush and I have the Bush Law Group uh, in Jacksonville. We service all of Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina, as well as Tennessee. And we are a first and third party property insurance coverage litigation firm. And our attorneys handle business claims as well as homeowners claims for insurance, for insureds who have a claim against their insurance company and the insurance company is not paying. And you can find out more about us at www.thebushlawgroup.net. Again, it's thebushlawgroup.net. So thank you so much, Stephen, for agreeing to uh, be interviewed for this today. I know you and I have been talking about this topic for a while, and I thought these this information would be good uh, to share with small business owners right now. I mean, there's a lot of uh, resources that are being released uh, in, the, in the way of loans and grants uh, by different levels of, of government, state and federal government, and now even some city um, incentives that are coming along too. But that's not the only tool to help small businesses through this time. Um, a lot of us have insurance policies in our businesses and part of those policies could be business interruption insurance. And I know I've been um, talking with a lot of small businesses and they're telling me that when they call their insurance agent, um, the insurance agents or the companies are just flat out saying, no, this is not covered. Um, you know, closures for COVID-19 are definitely not covered and they're just shutting them down right away. Um, so I, at some point I wanna get into that piece but before we go there, I want to talk a little bit about what is business interruption insurance just in general, without all this other crisis chaos going on. Tell us what business interruption insurance is. All right. So business interruption insurance is insurance or coverage through your property and casualty policy or a comprehensive policy where you have an add-on or a rider. And that insurance is there to cover lost income or, or lost profits during an interruption that you have. It also is there to cover any types of fixed expenses, such as rents, uh, any contract that the contracts that you're obligated to pay monthly could include uh, lights. It also can include salaries of employees. That's the other thing that it can include. So it includes a, a large variety. But one thing I want to say is, listen, business interruption insurance is a very broad topic we have all kinds of different businesses and every business has a different type of business interruption coverage so business interruption is specific to your business and and the way your business functions so in other words a movie theater will be different than a grocery store a grocery store may be different than a liquor store which may be different than a restaurant which may be different than a hotel which may be different from a warehouse. So you have to be, it's very specific. And, uh, and in the insurance policies, it's not always called business interruption. Sometimes it's called business income. So you have to look at the policy. It's very specific to policy language and it's specific to the industry. So it can cover a, a, a wide variety of things. So when insurance companies are just giving this blanket no to everybody who asks, 
that's not exactly accurate because they're not even looking at specific policies. They're not looking at specific industries and specific businesses. They're just doing this blanket no across the board. I mean, how do you feel about that? I think that's horrible. Um, listen, insurance companies are supposed to be there to pay claims when we have a claim. The unfortunate part about that is, is that they, they don't always do that. And the entire country has been shut down. And, and I believe, in my personal opinion, is that these insurance companies are terrified that they're going to be hit with all of these massive claims and it's going to bankrupt them. But listen, they have over $800 billion in reserves. This just came out a few days ago. Over $800 billion in reserves. And they don't want to pay it. They should be paying it. You, a, an insurance agent and an insurance company and an adju insurance adjuster should not just blanketly say, you're not covered. That's not true because they very well may be covered. And mm -hmm. part of their, what they're saying is like, you're not covered because there's been no physical damage to property. And we can get into that a little bit more in detail later, but you don't need physical damage to property in some instances and in some industries in order to have coverage. You just need an interruption and okay. that interruption. And that interruption can be from a civil authority order, whether it be state or federal that says, look, you got to shut down. You can't have people in here. That could be as much as to give you coverage. So it, it, spoilage, another thing, if you're a restaurant and you, and you have bought all this food and now you can't use it and you're having to throw it away, that may be covered under your insurance policy. So a blanket, no, you're not covered, incorrect. And they shouldn't be telling people that. The three large largest industry uh, conglomerates for insurance came out and and those three got together and they issued a statement to all insurance companies look tell your people it's not covered and that's not true you know insurance agents you know they're getting information from their their carriers you know i know so many good-hearted insurance agents that only want to help their people when when they're in trouble. And so what happens is, you know, they only have a certain amount of information that is available to them from their own carriers. And so they're just trying to say what information they have um, and they're trying to do a good job. Um, and I know that, you know, sometimes these big insurance companies and Stephen, I know you have years and years of stories to tell us about, you know, how insurance companies don't always act in the best interest of the insureds. So I want to talk about, you know, um, so insurance, it, it, they, what they cover, you talked about some of the, the benefits that they provide in what kinds of like in a normal world, what kind of situations would trigger these business interruption insurance policies? Okay. The key to most of them is that there has to be physical damage to the property. That's the link. Uh, and, and this is where a lot of the litigation is taking place right now. I don't know if you have heard, but there's uh, se been several very famous restaurants and chefs who have sued in federal court for what's called a declaratory action. And what they're doing is they're asking the court to determine right now quickly to make the determination as to whether or not the property has been physically damaged. So physical damage is usually the trigger but it's not the only trigger. So in it's usually some, like fire or um, hurricane, flood or flood. hurricane. Right. Okay. Anything of that sort. So, so what the, the, these first lawsuits, this first wave of lawsuits, I believe is going to set the precedent. All right. So it's going to set the table for what's going to happen in the future. Now there's already been a couple of cases with some case precedent setting already that says, in order for property to be physically damaged, it doesn't have to be structurally destroyed. So I believe that that in a lot of these cases that are currently already been filed with, with these declaratory actions, that we have a great opportunity and a great chance that the courts are going to rule that yes, the presence of COVID-19 and the coronavirus on surfaces and its propensity to be transmitted from person to person because it sticks to surfaces is causing physical damage to the property. 
And because it's causing physical damage to the property, that's going to trip coverage. And the other thing that trips coverage will be the civil authority orders that have been issued, closing down the businesses or restricting the business and its operations. A lot of restaurants right now are only doing takeout. And, and so they're losing a ton of money every day uh, because they don't have, have people coming into the dining room and sitting down and they're not turning over tables rapidly. So these things, the civil authority and the propensity for the virus to stick, stick to surfaces and be transmitted from person to person, in my opinion, causes physical damage to the property based upon some case law. You want to talk about that now or you want to wait on that? Yeah, I think I think I do want to talk about um, some right now that, you know, in, in a normal world, when we have, you know, let's say a fire and obviously you have physical property damage, your business is shut down, you file a claim for your business interruption insurance and they pay whatever benefits are particular to that insurance policy. So right now, then only thing we're talking about is what is the trigger point if we don't have a fire or some other physical damage? that is visible, we need to see if there is some other type of property damage. Um, is property damage the only trigger for policies? Most policies, yes. All right. Now I say that because again, we're talking about a very broad spectrum, right? We're talking about every business in America has been affected by this. Law firms, mm -hmm. uh, accounting firms, you know, uh, call centers. So, it's it's policy specific and it's industry specific so for most all of the um policies physical damage to property is going to trip the coverage but it's not just that it can also be the civil authority order shutting the business down or restricting the businesses ingress and egress Mm, okay, so there's two ways it could be triggered. It's the civil authority order with the government right. shutting you down, or it could be physical property damage. Exactly right. All right, let's talk about physical property damage first. Um, and 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 I, I, to my what I've been hearing is that insurance companies have been purely basing their no answer on this physical property damage. Like when I'm talking to people, they say, no, the insurance agent says there's been no physical property damage and therefore there's no, uh, there's no coverage at all. So let's talk about that one first, because that's the one I'm hearing the most. That's right. Um, that, that is the, the, the big sticking point. So I want to talk about two cases that, that we have that's already kind of set some precedent. The first one is Gregory Packing Inc. versus Travelers. Now, um, in that case, that's a New Jersey case, and the federal court held that that covered property had been physically damaged sufficient to trigger business interruption coverage when ammonia was released into a facility, making the building unsafe for habitation. All right. So how does that that lines up with what we have here with the corona, right? On the COVID-19, making it unsafe for habitation. And the court stated that property can sustain physical damage without experiencing structural uh, alteration. The presence of the molecules of ammonia upon the covered property was enough to count as physical damage to the property and triggered the business interruption coverage. So if you just take the words ammonia out, put COVID-19 in, this lines up pretty well with this case, which is already a, a federal precedent setting case for what we have going on now. So if, if you have a large number of people in your office or in your business in and out and, and you were forced to shut down or to make other arrangements for business, that in and of itself between the, the propensity for the virus to stick to surfaces, because we already have all kinds of medical experts have come out and said that, that it sticks to surfaces and it's transmitted from person to person that way, that could be enough, in my opinion, to cause physical damage based upon what the court said in Gregory Packing to uh, trigger coverage for you. Now, the second case is Motorist Mutual Insurance Company versus Hardinger. Um, this was a Third Circuit Court of Appeals case that dealt with E. coli. And here it says um, this was um, E. coli in a residential water well 
which made the inhabitants sick, counted as physical damage to the property, triggering the applicable homeowner's coverage. The court wrote that what mattered was whether the functionality, all right, see, this is the key, whether the functionality of the property was, was nearly eliminated or destroyed or whether the property was made useless and uninhabitable uh, by the presence of the bacteria. All right. So, but now here's the thing. This talks about bacteria, right? What do we have? Yeah, Word, that's right. Words matter, especially when you start litigating, right? All right. Mm -hmm. We have a virus and many of these policies do have a virus exclusion. What? Yes, they do. Uh, and many of them will have a virus exclusion. Now, how does that affect what uh, coverage, right? Well, if you have a virus exclusion um, at, at this point in time, I don't believe that we will be able to find coverage unless, unless you have a civil authority provision within the policy. And we can look at the policy and and find coverage for you under the civil authority for ingress and egress. All right. Okay. So I just, I, I just, this is, this is blowing my mind for just a minute. I, I got to back up on this. So first of all, they're saying some insurance companies are saying that there's no property damage because it's a virus. There hasn't been any structural changes. I mean, you look at the property, it looks exactly the same. You can't see it. So they're saying, right. well, there's no damage, but yet, some insurance companies have excluded virus as a possibility for property damage. So how can you have it both ways? I mean, if some insurance companies are saying virus is property damage and we're going to exclude it, how can these other companies say, oh, virus isn't even, a, isn't even in the equation? I mean, what's the, if it's not even in the equation, what's the point of putting in an exclusion? So that to me is this, this I mean, that's blowing my mind right now, but um, that's a, that's a topic for you and I to, to, to hash out <laughs> and speak out at over legal technology. Um, but right. I think, I think that um, what you just said was important because if you're, if you're purely basing your claim on property damage and you have specific language in your policy that says virus is excluded, you're saying it doesn't necessarily mean that you're out. It means that you may have to look at this other trigger, which is the civil authority trigger. Right. So here's what I want you to understand about insurance. Okay. Um, it's a contract, right? Uh, the policy is an insurance contract. All right. The contract is the courts always are going to look at the contract in the light most favorable to the non-drafter. The non-drafter is going to be the policyholder, the business, right? So if the business didn't draft it and the court's going to look at it in, in the light most favorable to, to the policyholder, then they're going to look to find coverage. Now, another rule of contract interpretation when it comes to insurance is that insurance adjusters, and this is what, what, what kind of angers me with them just blanketly saying there's no coverage. A, a general rule is that, that policies are to be read broadly to, it, to include coverage not narrowly to exclude coverage. And in, and in what these, uh, um, these insurance agents and these insurance companies, adjusters are doing, is they're just blanketly saying there's no coverage, forget it, you're out. Well, they can't do that because you gotta look at the policy. And this is where a lot of litigation is gonna come from after, okay, after we get the precedent on these first uh, couple of cases that have been filed Let's see, they're in New York. Uh, there's one in Tampa, one in New Orleans, one in uh, uh, San Francisco, one in, uh, in uh, Napa, and then one in Chicago. All of these courts, once they determine whether or not the virus does cause physical damage to property because it, because it sticks to surfaces and is transmitted person to person, if they, if they agree to that, then the next step of litigation, I believe, is going to be right here in, in this, this section. How are they looking at the policy? Are they interpreting it narrowly to restrict coverage or broadly to, to extend coverage? And, and they're supposed to look at it broadly so that to provide the most coverage possible, which is why I say, if you have a virus exclusion, don't count yourself out. There may be other areas of the policy, depending on the industry and the language of the policy, where you may be able to find coverage.
Okay, let's talk a little bit about precedent and case law and how all this works. I know we've got a question. And if anybody else has questions, please put them in the chat. I am keeping an eye on those and I will ask Stephen for you. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, case law. So when we're talking about everything you do is, is in federal court because you're suing insurance companies and therefore it's like not just within Florida or do you do some state court litigation too? Do I do? Uh, when you sue insurance companies because they fail to pay on a claim, is that in state court or federal court? Both. Okay. Both. Okay. Yeah, so, so when you said it's the New Jersey case about the ammonia, that's in federal court? That was a federal court case. That's right. Okay. So, does so how, that does it, how does it translate over into Florida, right? Yeah, right. Okay. So I, I haven't... I haven't looked real closely, but it's my understanding that Florida doesn't have anything, any any case precedent on point uh, to what we're talking about as closely as these other two cases. So if that's the case, we can reach outside of the state of Florida and say, hey, judge, this is the way that these other judges viewed something, something almost identical to what we have. And they ruled this way. So the judge can look at that and take that into consideration for making a ruling within state. But uh, but because it was in New Jersey, does that mean it's going to be the same law in Florida? No, but we can use New Jersey law to show the judges how they ruled so that our judge can better uh, make an, uh, the proper opinion in our case in Florida. Okay, so that's that's good to know. So if, if, if a state like Florida or whatever state you may be in um, – doesn't have a case on point already that says this is what we're, how we're considering it. They do tend to look at other um, cases jurisdictions, and ju yeah. jurisdictions um, and that's called persuasive precedent. And, and they do tend to follow those because they don't want to be the odd man out and think of it wrongly. Um, it's, it's not a guarantee though. You're right. No, um, it's not a guarantee. <laughs> so I, I'm interested in some of these cases that are being filed right now. So you talked about two. You talked about the E. coli and the ammonia that have already been done. Those are already on the books. Those are already set. Uh, right. The ones you just mentioned, I think you said Tampa, Napa, San Francisco, Chicago, uh, New Orleans. Those have been filed now but haven't been decided yet, right? That's right. Uh, and they filed a declaratory uh, action, uh, declaratory judgment. So what that is, is that's just where you go to the court and you say, hey, look, we have, we're unclear about something. We need to know, does the policy say A or does the policy say B? What does it say? Uh, clarify this state, this for us. So you ask the court a question is what it is. And then the court comes back with an answer so that you know how to move forward. The, those cases tend to move quickly. They don't they don't drag on forever and ever and ever because you're just pl basically putting a question before the court and the court answers it. So I expect those will get heard. And under the current circumstances and the current uh, atmosphere that we're in, I believe they'll be heard pretty quickly. OK, so so let's talk um, I, I, at the end of this. Don't let me forget to do this because I want to do that. I, I, I think it's important for people and how this whole process works to get to a court case to maybe force an insurance company to pay it, pay on a claim. So let's make sure we save enough time to do that. Okay. Um, so we've talked about property damage as one of the um, one of the triggers for this policy. And you have property damage, and we've got some precedent that says that you know um, molecules may cause property damage. So that's promising. We're gonna, you're going to keep your eye on those cases as they come out, and and perhaps be able to move forward with that. Um, let's talk about the other trigger, which is the civil authority trigger. And, and how does that work? Okay, so we have to have something that, that, that disrupts the business, right? We have to have something that, that, that stops the business from being able, to, being able to operate. And that's the civil authority order. So otherwise, uh, if the civil authority orders weren't issued, we'd still, everybody would still be in business. I wouldn't be at home today. I would be at the office, right? So th that's, that's the beginning state of causing the, the claim uh, to be initiated. And, and that's what's, what's causing the disruption of the business. The disruption of the business is not the presence of the virus, right? The presence of the virus is the result of the disruption. And, the, and, and that's what's caused the physical damage. But what disrupted our business was a civil authority coming in and saying, hey, look, you got to shut down. 
You can't continue to operate and have all these people in this close proximity. You got to social distance and, 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 and we've got all these stay at home orders. So the civil authority orders are extremely important. The, the second thing and um, that's important is a lot of these civil authority orders are saying, and they have language within the civil authority order that says that the virus causes physical damage to property because it has a tendency to stick to surfaces and be transmitted from person to person, therefore causing physical damage to property. So the civil mm -hmm. authority orders are right. So you, it's, it's like sewing a quilt together, right? That's mm -hmm. what we're doing. We're, we're just sewing a quilt together. And, this and is I just find another... it interesting because, you know, the government doesn't have this all encompassing power to just to kind of shut businesses down. I mean, we have they have constitutional parameters that they have to work within. So sometimes like for them to be able to rely on the constitutional power that they have to shut businesses down, they have to justify their actions. That's and right. one of the justifications is the presence of these molecules um, and 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 virus particles on this property so then they need to say it's on physical property and and that for therefore justifies their own actions of shutting things down but what you're saying is now we can rely on that that's right and and that's another trigger within the policy a lot of these policies now especially hospitality policies uh restaurants things of that sort they'll have civil authority uh, provisions within their business income, business interruption coverage, and that civil authority uh, order being issued in those policies may be enough to trigger coverage. What happens if, like, because the, they didn't really tell the restaurants to shut down, they just said you have to stop serving people inside the restaurant and you can still do takeaway. Right. I mean, is does that complicate the analysis at all? See, I don't think so. I think what it does is it helps it because what it does is now it's disrupted the ingress and egress, right? Mm -hmm. And there's coverage for ingress and egress. So if if the civil authority says you can't have them in here, all right, that's a disruption. That, that's who, who disrupted it. Uh, the disruption is the, the government, all right? So um, anytime a civil authority uh restricts or inhi or inhibits your business and causes it causes you to lose business because of that civil authority order that in and it's, of itself could be depending on the policy language and the industry enough to trigger coverage all right so this this magic language <clears throat> that that governments um are are putting into their civil authority order it says it actually says um due to um, property damage is that what the the language is right uh some of the civil authority orders are are saying uh not all of them but a few of them have said that look um they're issuing this civil authority because and then they list all these reasons and one of the reasons is is because the virus uh they're issuing it to pr to protect public health and safety and it says because the virus has a tendency to stick to services and be transferred from person to person and thereby causing physical damage to property. Mm, okay. So the, the jurisdictions that have that in the actual civil authority help establish this claim for business interruption insurance. That's exactly right. It helps to establish it and it, and it will help um, the businesses within that community, but it could also be enough if, if an attorney suing in a jurisdiction where they didn't place that language in there could use all of these additional, all these other ones, uh, jurisdictions where did have that language could go and say, hey, look, th they said it, ours just didn't. It's just a matter of terminology, but it doesn't change the fact that it still was causing physical damage to property. Okay. And, and I understand you're, you're working um, with, with various people throughout the state of Florida and, and some other states to, to encourage governments to put this language into their civil authority orders. Yes, it's very important. Uh, any civil authority order, any executive order, any amended order uh, should include that language because it's just going to be, be helpful for businesses in that, that jurisdiction struggling to get back up and running after all this to find coverage and to get some relief during this terrible time. It'd be because, I mean, governments are wanting to help small businesses right now, obviously, and they're wanting to see whatever they can do to help that. 
Um, I saw something the other day that said that uh, there was 15 million people in the service industry, 15 mm -hmm. million employees, and it was a trillion dollar a year um, business, a trillion yeah. dollars a year, 15 million people. I would sure hope that governments would want to help those people. I, I, I think th I think they do. I think they are. I think they're trying to figure out ways to do that. And business interruption insurance is, is I think, you know, and you were saying earlier uh, when we talked before that you really think this is going to be a, a, a huge movement, um, you know, not necessarily after all the dust settles, but as the dust is settling these things, I mean, they're already starting to come up in different courts. You, you, you see that this is going to be a big, a big movement in the courts with lots of lawsuits. I do. Um, there, there's some other stuff going on on a federal level, um, and and I'm not privy to a lot of that information. Just some some drops of it, and I'm thinking what's going to wind up happening in the end is that the government, the federal government, is going to step in and say, "Look, cover these business interruption claims, and then we will provide some some subsidies for you." to help relieve some of the financial pressure that you're going to be under. But like I said, look, they've got 800 and some billion dollars in reserve. Come on. Mm -hmm. Loosen the and purse it, strings. And, and if ever a business needed business interruption insurance, it would be now. Um, it would be know, now. <laughs> it would be now. Yes. Uh, and, and, you know, we've paid for those premiums, um, you know, all along for however long we've had the policies. And, you know, we deserve the coverage. If the coverage is there, then we deserve the coverage. And I think that's kind of what you've been talking about right now is, is the coverage there? Um, and, and just to kind of recap, um, organizing the information. So there's two triggers. One is physical property damage, um, and, and, and that's going to rely on some of these court cases that are coming out right now. And then the other one is the civil authority um, trigger, which the civil authority might say shut down. So for me, and I see what you're saying now about different industries, because for me, um, you know, I'm a law firm. As, as you are, and, and even the safer at home orders have come out and, and have declared us to be essential businesses, but we can't work in our office. That's and right. so, you know, my clients are mostly service professionals and a lot of us aren't necessarily shut down. We are just moved out of our, our business. Um, and, and some of that does cause disruption, um, you know, with courts being shut down right now, um, you know, and only emergency orders are being allowed and things like that. I think that um, I think that there's some some definitely some creativity um, in, in how you look at this traditional sense. And and I know you you're on top of being creative and how how you look at something through through this lens of, of disruption. Um, so let's talk about maybe some different industries. We've really focused on restaurants when people come in. Um, and, and the hospitality industry. Um, what are some other industries that you you can kind of guess that this might be a big issue for? All right, let, uh, let's step into it. Okay. Um, first, let's talk about what's, what is covered. And then we can start kind of applying these coverages to some of the industries. All right, so profits are, are, are covered. Listen, it's not necessarily your lost income, it's your lost profit. So it kind of has a, a has a, a different meaning. So, it, and it's based on prior month's performance. A policy will provide reimbursement for profits that would have been earned had the event not occurred. So profits is one. Now that could go into any business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, fixed costs. These can include operating expenses and other incurred costs of doing business. So what are some fixed costs for for me in my business? It's rent. You know, I have I have an office space that I pay rent on. Uh, it's telephones. It's my uh, legal services that I have, which is uh, Westlaw. It's uh, my servers. Uh, we use Ignite, and we also use my case. Those are fixed expenses every month. They're going to come up, so it's the same expenses come up. Every, that can be covered pretty much in any business. Temporary location. Uh, some policies cover the cost involved with moving to, to and operating from a temporary business location. I had a guy the other day that I was talking to and he did not have um, the ability to do takeout at his 
at one one restaurant, but he did at another. So he moved all of his operations from the restaurant that was not able to do tar- takeout to the other location. And so they're doing the kind of serving both both restaurants food side by side. And um, if there was an expense for him to do that, that could also be covered. Uh, but it just doesn't have to deal with um, with restaurants. It could be um, warehousing, manufacturing facilities. Uh, if you had a manufacturing company and let's say you have offices in different places and you were moving and, and then a hotbed is Florida for the virus or New York City and you had offices in another state like Nebraska where it's really not – not affecting anybody and you had to move uh, offices out to Nebraska to maybe to, to meet international clients demands. All right. That could be enough to trigger coverage commission and training costs. So in the wake of a business interruption event, a company will often need to replace machinery and retain personnel, uh, retrain personnel on how to use the new machinery. Business interruption insurance may cover these costs. Well, We don't necessarily have an instance where we had like a fire and our machinery got burned down. But what if you lost all your employees and they went to work somewhere else and now you have to bring in another another crew and you have to retrain all of those? That's an expense, right? So that in and of itself could, could cross businesses. And then extra expense. Business interruption insurance will provide reimbursement for reasonable expenses beyond the fixed cost. That allows the business to continue operating while the business gets back on solid footing. Um, so what could that be? Could that be interest on loans? Maybe, right? Um, civil authority, ingress and egress. A business interruption event may result in government-mandated closure of business premises that directly cause financial loss. We've been talking about that quite a bit. Examples include foreclosures because of government issued curfews or street closures related to a covered event. Well, uh, we're right back to this is this is perfect. This is what I was talking about. The civil authority order. It could be we could find coverage there. Uh, wage employees. Coverage of wages is essential if a business does not want to lose employees during the shutdown. This coverage can help a business owner make payroll when they cannot operate. I don't know about you, but I'm still paying my employees. All right. Uh, We're not working full time. We're not working as much. But if you have business interruption insurance, it's a possible and and you're in the same boat. You're still having to pay employees because you don't want to lose them. Right. You've got great people. Like I I have some of the best, uh, best people working in my office. I mean, you know them, Lori. They're they're pretty great. I don't want to lose them. I don't want (laughs) to lose them. So I'm having to continue to pay them. Um, Tax loan payments loan payments. Uh, All of these are are types of coverages that that are in business interruption policies and they expand out from business to business and and they cross lines. So it doesn't really matter what business you're in. But um, I think I I was up to the other day of counting. I think there's like 27 different types of business interruption coverage that that is specific to industries to your industry and to your type of business. And you just have to look at the policy. And another big important important thing is is for those people who are are listening to us is you have to you really have to um, understand the business and, and the way the business works. So you can't just look at just the policy. You have to say you have to look at how the business operates. And then be able to apply the operations of the business to the policy. So it's a little bit of a complex um, um, claim, business interruption, but but it just takes time and 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 focus and paying attention to how the business operates and how the business was affected, and then apply that to the coverages listed within the policy. Okay, so let's talk about the steps then. Let's say, because I I see some um, names on here in the webinar that I know, um, and some of them are restaurants and some of them are different industries. Um, What is the first step that they take? Obviously, some of them have called their insurance agent and their insurance agent says, nope, can't do it. Or they've called the insurance company and the insurance company says, nope, can't do it. Um, Okay. What's the first thing they should do? First thing to do is to file a claim. That's what you should do. So if you call... Or if you've already called and they've told you, no, it's not covered, great. Thank you. Will you please send me a letter telling me that? 
put it in writing to me, all right? So your phone call and getting it verbal doesn't matter. We need something solid in writing, all right? That's the first step. So they file the claim and they file the claim not by calling the insurance company. Like, how yes. do they file the claim? Well, you can call your agent or you can call okay. the insurance or you can call the insurance company direct. But but okay. but whoever you talk to, they need to send you a letter telling you you have coverage or you don't have coverage because without that letter, you know, we're really nowhere. That's okay. the first the first step is to uh, is to call and make a claim. Okay. And then get a denial or an acceptance in writing. Do All they right. need to say the basis of their claim or they just want to call and say, I'm making a claim against my business interruption insurance? Exactly. And they can say because of the uh, the COVID-19 or the uh, coronavirus okay. closure okay. For, from that. OK. All right. So that's the first step. The second step is to get a copy of your policy. Now, here's the key. When you call and get a copy of the policy from your agent, they're going to send you one of two things. They're either going to send you the deck page or they're going to send you the renewal, but you never get the full policy. So when you get asked for a copy of the policy, you want a certified copy of the full policy that includes the renewal and the deck page so that you okay. have it all. And you have to specifically ask for a certified copy to get all of that. That's exactly if you right. already have a copy, um, and you or I mean, would people normally just already have a copy of that when they sign up or do they always need to call and get a copy? Yeah, you need to call and get a current copy of your policy, because most of the time what, what we find that people have is they either have the first policy that was issued and no renewals or they only have the renewal and none of the other policies because you have to look at the policy as a whole. Right. And so every year they're changing things. You, you get these letters in the mail and say, hey, we've added this to your policy, but we took this away or your policy is was updated to include this, but now excludes this. Well, so those po that policy, that binder of policy of all those coverages changes from year to year to year. So the only way to know what you have currently is to get a full copy of the of the all the policy that is uh, current as of of now as of the, okay. the loss. Okay, so you ask for a certified copy from your agent, and you get the deck page. Uh, the renewal and the full language of every everything that's in there. Okay, that's right. and then what? That's right. All right. So once you get that and you you have the denial and you have the policy, then you need to have the policy reviewed, and you should have it reviewed by an attorney who understands how to look at a policy and read a policy. Now, that's not uh, me, by the way, people. That's not me. <laughs> I, I I don't know how to read a policy to that level, which is why we're talking to Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> right. So so find a, find an attorney who who works in the insurance industry and who works on, in the property insurance industry. I know once the uh, hurricane started, a lot of attorneys who were doing personal injury started trying to do hurricane work. And we started getting all these phone calls saying, hey, you know, we we're now doing property insurance and we are we've got this problem now. How do we fix it? And uh, and I was going, well, you know, property is not personal injury. Uh, and and it is a different area of law. So you want to try to find an attorney who who specializes or who whose main area of practice is property insurance coverage litigation to review your policy with you and make an appointment. Go in, sit down. If you can't go in and sit down, send it to them by email. Ask them to give you a coverage determination and see if they can find coverage for you and if they can help you. Okay, so I understand that you are willing to make a very generous offer for our invitees of the webinar and that you're, you're offering to do that type of a review um, at no charge. Is that correct right. for, the, for the attendees? Right. Okay. Right. We, we always do. That. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, we always do that uh, because if we can't help you, we can't help you. Right. And uh, if we can, we want to be able to help you. And so reviewing the policy to see if we can find coverage, you know, we do that on our time and uh, we don't charge for that. Never have. Yeah and don't plan to any time in the future. Okay, so you don't ever charge for that, no matter no. what this, okay, fantastic. No. So how would people then um, set that up with you? How, how do you want them to reach out and, and get that going? Well, you can uh, go straight online to bushlawgroup.net and uh, there's a little, cuss, uh, little inquiry button there you can push and, 
and uh, give us your name and information, and when someone in my office will contact you. Or you can call us directly at 904-552-1006. Um, and talk with with anyone in the office and tell them that you want ask them to to you want a policy review for a business interruption and they'll tell you how to get everything over to us. And you want them to go ahead and have a claim denial first before they talk to you. I would really like for it, them to do that. We have time now because we're still at home, so you can do some of this stuff while you're at home. You can call, get the denial started. Um, get the letter in the mail and you can start requesting the policy because that's what I'm going to tell you to do anyway is to give me the policy and, and make a claim. And once you've done that, then come back and see me because there's not really anything I can do or review with you that's going to give you some good solid information until we have those two things. Okay. So, um, so what's going to happen then once, once you do the review, let's say that um, you review the particular policy language and you sit down and you or Zoom <laughs> with somebody and say, how does your business function? What's been going on in your business? How you've been harmed? And then you make the determination that um, there should be coverage. What happens then? Okay, so that's when all the work starts, right? Um, I, I want to I wanna just gently touch on something real quickly because it's very important. Um, all policies have what's called post-loss obligations. So you have all these, these requirements that you have to fulfill before you did, can file a lawsuit. Now, I'm not saying you need to file a lawsuit. I think a lot of these claims will be able to be resolved over the phone without filing a lawsuit. Uh, and so what, what I would do in reviewing the policy is try to find out what some post-loss obligations are. And one of those post-loss obligations may be to submit a proof of loss a sworn statement in proof of loss. And what that is, is where you're sending in a statement that says, look, I've had a, I've had, um, uh, a covered claim and I've got a loss and the loss is this amount. And this is a supporting documentation to support that loss. And then you have to submit it to the insurance carrier. And then once you submit it to the carrier, they have so many days to review it and then either deny it, pay it or partially pay it, whatever the case may be. So, what we want to do is after we have your policy and we determine that you have coverage, we want to look at the post-loss obligations. We want to make sure we fulfill all those post-loss obligations. And once we've done that, then this is where the fun starts. Uh, and that is trying to figure out what coverage you have and the dollar amounts that those coverages are, are, are going to be extended to you. And that's where, where business income and business interruption becomes very tedious and there's all these formulas and calculations and things of that sort. So sometimes, especially on large losses, uh, you have to get a forensic accountant involved. And a forensic accountant can take all of your information, put it all together, and very quickly whip out to us and say, okay, here's the numbers. Here's what their lost profits are. Here's what their fixed expenses are. Here's the other uh, other." Um, dollar amounts that are going to be covered under other areas of the policy and they break it out for you and, and basically just serve it to you on a silver platter. And then what you do is you go to the insurance company and you say, Hey, here it is. Here's the breakdown we'd like for you to pay. And then they start trying to nick and pick at coverages and nick and pick at dollar amounts. And then they mm -hmm. want, you know, and then it just goes off into nowhere, nowhere land and we just have to keep fighting it. But, but the first step, make the claim. Second step, get the denial. Third step, request the policy. Fourth step, have it reviewed. And if coverage is available, fifth step, comply with post-loss obligations. Sixth step is for the attorney or the public adjuster. Listen, I don't. I, I want to say something about public adjusters. Um, your first um, uh, approach at this may not need to be with an attorney. It may need to be with the public insurance adjuster. And there's some great public insurance adjusters out there who understand business interruption coverage and who actually can help you tremendously to get things together. And a lot of times attorneys will use public adjusters to do that. So you don't have to come straight to the attorney. You can go straight to a public insurance adjuster as well um, to help you get this stuff together. Now, do you, if somebody were to come to you and say, hey, can you help me find a public adjuster? Is, is that something that, that you would help them do or 
All the time. We do it all the time. Okay. We, yep. We recommend public adjusters as the first line of, I say the first line of defense, but it's really the first line of offense uh, in order to get the claim denied and set up and ready so that you have a dispute with the carrier. But, but public adjusters are a great place to start. But one who understands and has experience in business interruption and business income loss. Okay. So, so, you know, it, I'm just thinking from my perspective, right? If I, I'm interested, I might send you my policy to review. Um, but if a business is already saying, you know, I'm, I'm losing all this money, you know, how am I supposed to afford to hire an attorney? How am I supposed to afford to hire a, you know, a public adjuster? How does that work? Well, we take, we take in most all property insurance litigators take cases on a contingency fee basis. Uh, and that's why we only take cases we think we can win. <laughs> so, right? Because you don't want to spend time on one you don't think you can win. Mm -hmm. So, so it doesn't cost you any money up front. And you don't have any out of pocket expense. And you have somebody on your side who's working with you to try to get you, uh, get you coverage and to get you, get you paid. So we don't charge up front. We don't ever take a fee up front. And, um, and it's always if you win, then we get paid. And okay. there's the, the public adjusters work that way too. They, uh, do they? Yes, yes. Okay. Public adjusters work the same way. That's right. They sure do. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the first step is to get yourself uh, denied, and then or or, or paid, hopefully. Um, but if you do get denied, then then you have this resource here um, that Stephen's offering. Stephen and his group are offering, and. Um, and they can help you kind of figure out whether it's worth taking it forward and um, and seeing if there's money there that can that can help you during this time. Um, Stephen, did, I'm going to look for a minute on some of these questions. And while I'm reading them, is there anything else you wanted to make sure we share with people? Yeah, I do. Get the word out. All right. Everybody knows somebody who has a business. Uh, I was thinking the other day, how many people do I know that have business? Do I really know anybody who has a business? As a matter of fact, I know a lot of people and I'm sure that you do too. Get the word out. Tell people, don't be discouraged. Don't just take no for an answer. G investigate, use other resources that, that are free. And, and a property insurance coverage attorney should look at a policy for you and be able to determine whether or not you have coverage and not charge you for it. And, and just don't give up. Don't give up hope. See what you have. Let's press forward. Let's see. And, uh, and try to stay positive. I mean, I, I know, I, listen, I've been in business for 30 some odd years in one form or the other. And I have had very successful businesses. And I actually had a business that went out of business uh, at one point. And, and what happened was I had a distributorship and the parent company went out of business, which put me out of business. You know, one day I just got a phone call and said, hey, look, we're closing the door. Sorry. Good luck. And, uh, and, and I know what it's like to be in that position. And it's scary. You feel like a failure and you feel like you're, you're trapped and there's nothing you can do. But you've got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. you got to shake that off. You got to get out there and you got to take one step forward and then another step, another step. And part of doing that is don't give up. Go to an attorney. And then if that attorney tells you there's no coverage, go to another attorney. See what he has to say. But keep moving forward and, and seeing what you can do. I love that. Good. Uh, all very, very good advice. A um, couple questions here for you. For a loss other than uh, through a municipal authority, due to the requirements of having to mitigate the loss to prevent further damage, um, should the insured have their business decontaminated? Um, that's a good question. And that's it's interesting <laughs> right now because, uh, first of all, who's going to decontaminate it because everybody's right. shut down right now? Right. I mean, you can't get in right. there. But let's but assume that when it's all opened, you know, do we – you know, do we go in and decontaminate it? Um, I, I would say, yeah, in my, my, in my opinion, yes, you need to do something, right? You should, you should do it just because you don't want to spread it and you don't want to catch it either. So if it's nothing more than you going to the store and buying some Clorox cleanup and some gloves, a mask, the goggles, and you get in there and you spray the surfaces down and you wipe them down yourself, do something. 
Yes, do something. And, and also it gives us a uh, attorneys in litigation. It would give us a defense to any offense that the um, um, insurance uh, attorney would try to say, hey, you, did, you didn't you, you didn't have any damage because you didn't do anything to clean up, did you? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I did do something to clean up and, and to try to prevent it from being spread. So, listen, safe is always better than sorry. Uh, so I would, even if you did it yourself by taking the proper precautions, gloves, mask, goggles, and some type of, uh, of recommended cleaner. Uh, and I, and I think the CDC and the FDA and everybody else has put out all of these recommendations for over the counter cleaners that you can use. All right. Well, it looks like we are out of time. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen. This has been amazing information, um, for me, as well as I know, uh, our attendees, um, Definitely complex information, um, but there are resources out there to help you. Uh, I think Stephen's message of don't give up is is really um, appropriate in this circumstance. Try to get every single resource you have available to you. And if business interruption is one of those resources, absolutely follow through. See what this can possibly bring you um, during this time to kind of help your business get over this hump. Um, Stephen, you want to, it's the bushlawgroup.net. Right, bushlawgroup.net. And then um, if they want to go online and they can either submit the form online or give you a call if they want you to go ahead and take a look at that. Exactly. All right. Very good. Well, thank you all. We are, we did record this and we may go ahead and post it somewhere. This was a very like just um, a spontaneous webinar to get this information out there. So we may post it somewhere. And if we do, we'll be certain to let you all know. Um, thank you for attending and everybody stay safe, healthy, and sane. <laughs> Thank right. you, Goodbye, Stephen. Goodbye, everybody. Thank mm -hmm. you. Bye. <clears throat>